On this Tuesday episode of the Locked On Texans podcast, Javon Baker, can he be the wide receiver to fill the void that Houston so desperately needs? And Cole Thompson of Sports Illustrated joins the show. You are Locked On Texans, your daily Houston Texans podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Houston and Texans fans across the nation, welcome to this Tuesday episode of the Locked On Texans podcast, a part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. First and foremost, we hope you guys had a very good Easter weekend. I uh, saw a lot of babies out there. Everybody looked amazing with their family, and hopefully this will be a blessed week for the Houston Texans. Last time we talked about the you know, Titus Howard restructuring his contract, allowing Houston to free up a bunch of space. They sit around $30 million in cap space. Hopefully the the football guys will come down and, you know, bless the Houston Texans with a big move. But Mm. on today's episode, uh, we're looking at a few things, first and foremost. But thank you for all of our first-time listeners that are watching or listening to the show. Please subscribe, like, and comment to the Locked On Texans podcast on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Also follow on Twitter at Locked On Texas. And thank you to all of our returning listeners lending your ear for another episode. As Cody and I continue to talk Texans, I'm your Texans football analyst, John, some sports guy, Hickman. On the other side of the screen, y'all know who it is. Say it with me, Cody Davis, sports yes, on Texans credential media member, what I like to call one of the hardest working men in sports in the Houston Texans, Houston Rockets, Sabercats, whatever you – and the Sabercats are undefeated. But whatever you want to talk about with sports, Cody has his hand around it some kind of way. Um, uh, we, we're going to be looking at when and where the Texans should consider drafting a running back. Uh, I think that's still an important topic. Mm. Well, they addressed it with Joe Mixon. Last week we talked about Damian Pierce. I don't think the job is done. We'll be having a draft outlook with one of my favorite people to talk sports with. That's Cole Thompson of the SI family. But we open up today's show talking about Javon Baker, who had a top 30 visit with the Houston Texans. Mm -hmm. Could he be the wide receiver that can help fill the void this team needs? Before we dive into that, guys, today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. We're going to make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's 200 bucks in your pocket if your bet wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. So, listen, right now the Texans have Nico Collins. Hmm. 1,500 yards last year, first year playing with a elite quarterback. Tank Dale, the rookie, had a sensational rookie year before he went down. Uh, with his injury, the Texans bring back Robert Woods as of right now. I mean, the Texans bring back, excuse me, Noah Brown, as of right now, Robert Woods is still on this roster. And there is a lot of expectation slash hope, and I think a lot of it is more so hope, for John Mechie and both John Mechie and Xavier Hutchinson. But as of right now, as we stand at this time of recording, this is still, in my opinion, my humble opinion, a very top-heavy wide receiving group. Mm -hmm. Look at a lot of the wide receiving cores in the NFL – I don't think Houston cracks top 10. You can make an argument that they won't crack top 15 as of right now. But Javon Baker is an interesting prospect. Right? Came into college at Alabama, spent his first couple of years under Nick Saban, right? And he progressively got better every year. He progressed every year. Uh, when, you, when you look at his numbers, Cody, uh, last year, 1,100 yards, seven TDs. Uh, but what impresses me the most, 14.4 yards per carry, 14.2 yards per carry, per catch, excuse me, and then 22 yards per catch last year. 52 catches over 1,100 yards. Uh, he's a guy that can make plays down the field, Cody. And so he's a guy that I think for Houston, I start to wonder to myself because they haven't addressed it yet, how high on the priority list is it for Houston to upgrade this wide receiver room? And I think Baker is an interesting prospect because when I look at picks, maybe 59, 86, right there for Houston, 
I think he'd be an available prospect, especially at 80, 86. Mm-hmm. And I think he'd be an interesting prospect. If he comes in right now, I do believe day one he's probably better than at least two of the wide receivers on the roster. So let's talk about Javon Baker. Um, I can confirm that he did have a th- top 30 visit with the Houston Texans. And man, John, I'm not going to lie. I really like this, you know, and you, you know, you're talking about the, the next couple of picks that the Houston Texans have in the draft. Look, to first answer your first question, how high should improving this wide receiver unit, how high should that be on the Texans priority list entering the draft, man? I'm going to just go ahead on out and say it. It should be number one because, yes, we all know how much improving the defensive line and improving the front seven. We know how important that is to coach the Miko Ryans, but you already did a damn good job at that in free agency. You know, later on in the show with Cole Thompson, we're going to sit here and talk about whether or not and when the Houston Texans should take a chance on a running back in this year's draft class. However, you already got a damn good start with the addition of Joe Mixon. So when you take a look at the top two positions, oh yeah, and cornerback as well. Look, Nick Casario, we say that almost every single week here on this show. Nick Casario wants to find somebody that he can start next to Derek Stingley Jr. I don't know about you guys, but I 100% believe that Jeff Okuda can be the cornerback number two for the Houston Texans. So corner, defensive line, running back unit, you already got a good head start. And the only position group that definitely needs an opportunity, needs a chance to make sure that you add weapons to is that wide receiver unit. We talk about it almost every single day here on this show because it's surprising that this is a team. We know what this offense did midway through the season when everybody was healthy. But yet, at the end of the day, it was still, like you mentioned, John, top heavy with Miko Collins and Tank Dell. And to go back to what Coach D'Amico Ryan said when I asked him at the NFL Combine, you know, how do you go about improving this wide receiving, receiving core? The number one thing that he said, playmakers and guys that can create separation. When you take a look at Baker coming out of UCL, that is a wide receiver that actually meets all the attributes that Coach D'Amico Ryan and Nick Casario are looking for. Plus, he's definitely going to come in and just give the Houston Texans just another reliable wide receiver that they can utilize. Because, John, I look at it like this. Remember last week we talked about John Mechie? If John Mechie could come in and and take the helm as wide receiver number three, all that's going to do is have somebody like Baker that you can basically share that title with or somebody that could come in and and fill the void whether or not injuries start to take a void with this team. Because I think the one thing that we can all agree with, Had the Houston Texans had a little bit more weapons with their wide receiving core, just maybe, just maybe they would have put up a better output against the Baltimore Ravens. By the way, every time we ask Coach D'Amico Ryans, where and how do you want to see your team improve throughout the offseason heading into 2024, he always went back to the, the playoff loss against the Baltimore Ravens and it and is and, and it's one hundred percent noticeable because that is the one game that we all said, man, if Tank Dale was held healthy, man, if they had another wide receiver, maybe they could have done X, Y, and Z. But John, I'm all for it. If they have an opportunity to draft Baker, I'll be happy with it. You know, I think with Baker, Baker has you, you know an interesting. I get an interesting outlook when I look at Baker because. We talk about, you know, the top two dogs on this team at that position, Mm -hmm. Nico Tank. And I think Baker will be a perfect boost for the bottom of this wide receiving core. And and, and I think when I, you know, when I look at that, you know, a lot of hope, a lot of if, and a lot of, a lot of, you know, believing that Mechie will take a step. But imagine a core where it's so full, Nico Tank. Baker met you, you know, interchange mm-hmm. in three, four, whatever the case is. And so, I, and I think that's probably why we're looking at him as a uh, late second rounder, you know, third mm-hmm. round type of guy. Uh, seen a lot of mock drafts to where he's taking, and, you know, mock drafts are just mock drafts, but where he's taking in between 55 and 90. And Houston has two picks between 55 and 90. They have a shot to get him. I, I just like how his, you know, he can come in. And he won't be one, two, maybe not three immediately, 
but he can help fill out that roster uh, at that wide receiver position. Another thing about Baker, 15 deep catches on the year, which put him third in the country, and he was eighth in the country in deep catch yards with 574. So I mentioned, you know, the 22 yards per catch. Guys, that's what I like about him a lot. Uh, caught nine out of 16 contested passes. And trust me, you know, he got a quarterback like John Plumley, who isn't the greatest. Had mm-hmm. a lot of late passes thrown to him his way. So <laughs> you look at some of those passes that, you know, maybe could have been completed easily uh, for Baker, but they just came a little bit late. Uh, he doesn't win solely off speed, but, and, and this is what you guys are like, just by being technically sound as an efficient route runner. Uh, there's not a lot of wasted movement when he runs routes. Uh, I like that. Uh, he gets to where he needs to be. And uh, another aspect of his game, I mentioned the quarterbacks that he played with, well, he adjusts to the ball well when the ball is in the air, right? Not always the easiest of catches going on, hence six, nine catches uh, from 16 contested passes. So uh, he does a very good job adjusting his body, adjusting his hands to it. Uh, I like his hips uh, because of this Baker, you know, because of his non-wasted movement and his ability to get open, Baker has seven games this past season where he had a big play of 40 or more yards. And of those seven, 50 were five were 50 or more yards. So he's going to make big plays. That's his, that's been his MO, right? That's what he's been able to do specifically dating back to his last season in college. And he has a pretty good change of direction in terms of quickness, not speed, but quickness. And he, he seems to find a way to always get into the open field. He's, he's a dangerous player in open field. Um, and I mean dangerous again, guys. He, some of those plays that he made downfield weren't just always big catches. Some of those were, you know, I'm taking the ball, I'm catching a slant, I'm catching, a, you know, maybe a dig, and I'm just, you know, getting past everybody else, the defenders. So, I like him here with Houston, man. I really do, and I think he's a guy that, especially when I look at what he was able to do last year, uh, you, you know, 102 snaps in the slot. When you look at those, uh, you know, in the slot attempts, 14 catches. That put him at 251st in the country, in the nation, but 367 yards would put him at 147th in the nation. So, again, he's a guy that can take something short, take something mid, and make a big play out of it. And that's a guy you want to see play with C.J. Stroud, right? That's a guy you want to see that can play alongside Tank and Nico. If Houston doesn't address, and honestly, even if they do, you know, Progressive, Geico, uh, you, you name any of the big insurance companies, there's always a premium on and being extra careful, right? And we saw with this team last year, Noah Brown injury, Robert Woods injury, Nico injury, Tank Dell injury. Uh, uh, John Mechie had to be brought on slowly due to injury. So this is a team that desperately needs to, like they're doing with the cornerback position, like they're doing with the defensive line position, like they have with the offensive line position. Just make sure that they have the necessary depth at a position that they want to see grow, that they want that depth for because they know how much it can hurt them when the top guys go down. And again, that's why I think Javon Baker fits in perfectly, Cody and listeners. He's not going to be a top guy, right? Potentially, maybe, but when he comes in day one, I think he's a guy that you can just fill in right at the bottom, and he helps the entire group out, which I like for Houston. Man, hey, listen, I don't know about you guys, but the sports calendar right now is loaded, and FanDuel is making it even more exciting to get in on the action. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's 200 bucks you can use to bet on the tournament. Uh, shout out to the Bayou Barbies at the time of this recording. We're rooting for them. I know I am. MLB, NBA, shout out to the Rockets and Jalen Green. We got a play-in push. You got hockey. So much more that you can bet on. Just visit FanDuel slash Locked On and make your first bet a big win. America, number one sports book, FanDuel. Visit fanduel.com slash locked on. Welcome back in, locked on Texans listeners and viewers. Y'all know who it is. Y'all see it at the bottom of the screen. Uh, I like to call him a champion. He is a champion in my eyes. He's a former teammate of mine, and uh, he's a winner. Give it up 
for Sports Illustrated Zone, Cole Thompson. Welcome to the Locked On Texas (laughs) podcast. And I just want to jump right into it. We just Wait, why didn't you tell me to bring the ring? I would have worn the ring if I would have known this was happening. It's I in my drawer, and now I don't want to walk away and ruin the conversation because we don't have a lot of time. But now I got to go grab the ring, and I got to take photos of it for later because we are the champions, yeah, and we are the everyone champions. needs to rem- everyone needs to remember. Cody Davis was not a champion. He was on the losing <laughs> side of the bracket. We won it, though. We won, and we, we got it done. Y'all didn't get nothing done. Uh, what do get what nothing done. Yeah, I'm sorry. I broke up a pass for DJ Anime, who literally decided to go straight to no, no, Barkley that game. DJ, no, I'm DJ I'm was – I was on the I was on the losing team because DJ was LeBron James in 2007. Like there was nothing more he could do. I was naming Jones. Let me just say that. <laughs> so you, were you Jr. Smith getting the wrong pass? Was that you? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, Cole! I want to hop right into it, man. Cody. We just talked about Javon Baker being a possible Houston Texan. We know that he had a top 30 visit, but you know. Aside from wide receiver, if that is a side, I want to ask you for your opinion. What are your overall thoughts of this draft right now? What's your outlook for the Houston Texans in terms of of the draft? Well, here's the good news. Everyone started freaking out when you traded away pick number 23 with the Minnesota Vikings to get a future 2025 second round pick. Uh, Let's go ahead and calm the EA air right now and ease some tensions Minnesota is not going to be a good team in 2024 unless a lot of things swing their way. That means that the rookie quarterback has got to be up to a C.J. Stroud type level. You got to have more consistency with the rushing attack. There was a reason why Aaron Jones was released from the Green Bay Packers. Maybe that's because if you're going to find out when he goes to Minnesota, the defense is fine, but it's not great. I do think it will take a huge step forward in year two under Brian Flores. But this draft is just so loaded with talent at wide receiver, defensive back, even offensive tackle for that matter, to where if you felt comfortable moving down 18 spots to bring in enough draft capital over the next two years, you should really be counting your blessings. Because not only is this going to help you when it comes to setting the new rate of what it's going to cost in terms of extensions for guys like Derek Stingley and Nico Collins starting next offseason, This is also going to allow you to evaluate talent in the short-term span to kind of figure out, okay, instead of holding out hope for this one second-round player, what can we go ahead and trade him for now if he's no longer a part of our solution and we have got to get better? We are trying to show that we are transcending into that upper echelon category. For wide receiver, you know, a guy like Javon Baker makes a lot of sense. He was a great number one threat for John Reese Plumley at UCF last year. I think the range of what we're talking about with him, probably third round 86 makes a lot of sense. He's a complimentary piece. One thing that I've noticed about his game is that you can pair him alongside a vertical threat. You can pair him alongside a speed threat. You can pair him alongside of a forceful red zone type target. And he's going to be able to come ahead and make some plays. He's got some good straight line speed. He's got some great hands, exceptional fluidity. I think there's a lot to like about him. I think there's also a lot to like about the guys who are going to be in play at pick number 42. And the main guy that, honestly, I would be running, running to the podium for, if possible, which really hurts me as an Alabama grad, but that's neither here nor there. Ladin McConkey is exactly what is needed for this offense. The guy is not, for starters, the guy is not Danny Amendola, and he is not Julian Edelman, so let's stop with that comp. Let's not go there. If anything, he's more so Garrett Wilson. The fluidity of his route running, the tempo, the breaks, the ability to create separation in the middle of the field, and he's versatile. He played a lot of his reps last season on the outside of Georgia, but he can shift inside of the slot position. A lot like Tank Dell, who last season had 31% of his reps on the inside position, so this allows you to be a little bit more dynamic and fluid with your mm-hmm. offense. Uh, other guys that make a lot of sense here, Jalen McMillan out of Washington, really good yeah. number two wide receiver last season. Not 2023. He was injured for a couple games due to a knee, uh, knee contusion in the opener. But if you go back and you watch him in 2022, there was a reason why Michael Penix Jr. was slinging it around the yard. And it wasn't because of number one. It was the double down one in Jalen McMillan at number 11. Also, Jalen Polk out of Washington, really good six foot three, good body control size, can play inside, can play on the outside. Nice overall route runner, good smooth hands. I think Malachi Corley, you know, he has the nickname yeah. Yak Machine out of uh, Western Kentucky. He he ate everywhere he was on the field. He was able to find little creases and just create 
that feedful mantra of what is needed at that number three wide receiver spot. I think the same thing goes for cornerback as well. You got guys like Kamari Laster out of Georgia, really good physical type of player. That's exactly the type of player that you want if you're at Tobacco Ryan's defense. Talk to him. Mike, talk to him. Mike Singstrill is the one that I will talk to them about because Mike Singstrill out of Michigan, he's five foot nine. He is going to be a nickel defender only at the next level. But you want to talk about a guy that has unrelenting fear, is not afraid to go ahead and die for a running back who weighs 245 pounds, knock them into the next week, and then stand over them and say, try me again. That is the type of guy you get in St. Strill. Last season, he had six interceptions. He also, I think, led the team back back years in pass breakups. TJ Tampa is another name out of Iowa State that probably could be in play at pick number 59. And maybe if you want to trade down for pick number 42, get an extra third round pick if possible, that could be in play. So the good news is the talent in this class is very, very loaded, top to bottom at every position. And there's an ample amount of talent at every level of the field to where you're walking out of the first two rounds for you, I guess, second and third round for you guys. You're walking out feeling very content where the team is and where the team is headed in the in the, in the not so distant future. When you were talking about the wide receivers, that's one name I was waiting for you to say, and that's Anaya Smith. Um, Cole, okay. I really want to ask you, you know, what are your thoughts about Anaya, especially knowing that this is somebody that you had an opportunity to cover a lot as um AM beat writer? So Anias is definitely, I think, a guy that you're going to want more so for your special teams than you will at wide receiver. That does not mean he can't be a productive wide receiver. Last few years at Texas A&M, finished anywhere with over 400 to 700 receiving yards. The offensive personnel at A&M was really lackluster during the final era of the Jimbo Fisher tenure because of they just never wanted to be more dynamic. They had a certain mantra about themselves. This was our MO, the way we do things here. And it really hurt the scoring opportunities, but it didn't hurt when it came to first downs, which was an area of expertise for Anaya Smith. I think what really stands out about him, though, is his ability on punt returns. This was a guy who has made history in the SEC. He's the only player in league history to have over 2,000 receiving yards and 1,000 punt return scrimmage yards. He's had two years where he's returned a punt for touchdown as well. So, he is going to find creases in the open space. He is going to move Scoot and Boogie his way all the way up for a first down. <laughs> he is going to be a guy that is going to last in the NFL, I think, for eight or nine years, simply because of what he brings in special teams. Now, from a wide receiver standpoint, this is a guy that you're probably you're targeting on day three with looking to compete alongside the Xavier Hutchinsons, the Steve Smiths, the John Metchies of the world. They're good enough to be on the active roster, and they're certainly good enough to, I think, be competing for reps, but they're not promise reps. They're not like a, a Nico Collins or a Tank Dell when you bring them in. You're saying, you're going to be working with the first team. We need you to over-exacerbate your limits because of we know how special of a talent you could be. With Smith, it all comes down to special teams. If you can get him to be an eventful punt returner, be effective on kick returns as the number two guy, maybe even just be a gunner on punts or, punt or on kickoffs, any one of those formalities, that's what you're looking for in a guy like Anaya Smith. And he loves it. You know, the one thing that I, I noticed about him and all my conversations I've had over the years, his tenaciousness of wanting to be known for his special team skills. He goes by the nickname of Sub-Zero. He wants everyone to know that he is Mr. Versatility. He wants everyone to realize Agent Zero is here to stay. And honestly, I, I think that if you were able to add him to your offense, add him to your special teams, you're bettering your, you're bettering your team for the long run. The question is, how much better are you going to get with him as a wide receiver three versus what would you need to go ahead and bring in as a wide receiver four? Like the conversation that we always have right now, what's the right move in free agency? Is it going out and over splurging on a wide receiver or maybe targeting someone in the draft and build that way? Well, when it comes to an Anaya Smith, this is where maybe you want to go out and add in a Tyler Boyd. You want to go mm. ahead and trade for I somebody. You want to add that one other piece and then have good depth but it's a little different if you were to go ahead and say target a Javon Baker or target a Ladd McConkey. That's one where you say, let's pass on the depth and the veteranship. Let's just get two young guys and let them dish it out in practice. Uh, we're going to talk about the running backs in the last segment, but really quick because we, we, you know, we talked about briefly, very briefly on Twitter, Kamari Lasseter. I'm a fan of him. So, yeah. you know, for the, for the guys that may not know much about Lasseter, uh, can you break it down? For some of the guys out there, from for our listeners and viewers, because 
I like Okuda. I think Okuda has a shot to be this team CB2, right? I think he did a very good job of redeeming himself last year in Atlanta. But Henderson, I, I can see him not making this roster. I could, this is still, for me, an opportunity this team has, even though they have the depth, to go draft a very good, solid cornerback. And Lasseter could be that guy. Can you just dive into him a little bit? Yeah, here's the thing. The, the good news about adding in an Okuda and a Henderson it doesn't take you away from the cornerback position whatsoever. You can look top to bottom. If you were at pick number 23, I was probably one of the only few people in the market that was on this trajectory for a while. The second that I knew that Steven Nelson was not coming back, pick 23, pick a cornerback, circle him on your big board, and draft him there. That is what you need to bring in because you have to address opposite of a guy in Derek Stingley Jr., whether or not it's the injury concern, the potential losing him in free agency in a few years, whatever the case may be, you don't know what you're going to have for the long run with a Derek Stingley Jr. And also, it's not a guy that was drafted by D'Amico Ryans. It was drafted by Nick Casario, but Ryans may have a different feel about a guy like him over, a, say, a player like Mari Laster. Imagine if you could uh, build a human nuclear ball that just wanted to eviscerate and explode and destroy everything in its pathway. And that would probably be the best version of Kamari Laster that I could come up with because the man just is fearless. He literally is not afraid of any type of receiver, any type of tight end, any running back out of the backfield, being a delayed blitzer, not being, I mean, being willing to make plays against the run. He's a little bit on the smaller side. He's only six foot, but he plays like he's six foot three. He's physical at the point of attack. He does extremely well in press man coverage. He is not afraid to dive his nose toward the football. He is more than capable of holding his own against number one receivers. He just helped Georgia in back-to-back -back years win national titles. So you know that he's played in the biggest and toughest conference in all of college football. And I might also add, he played underneath a guy who has been known for years, whether it be in Tuscaloosa, whether it be in Athens, punching out defensive talent on Kirby Smart. And this was a kid that started every single year and fought with Keely Ringo for first team reps in 2022. Ringo was viewed as a first round talent. And last year was like, hey, no, 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 no. Uh, I'm better than you. I'm going to show I'm better than you. You can go ahead and ride it into day three. And that's exactly what happened with Keely Ringo. But more importantly, you're getting a player who fits what D'Amico Ryans wants. Always about the swarm. The entire process that we have heard throughout the last set, the last year and a half, swarm mentality, swarm mentality. You know who swarms to the football? Whether it be against the run, whether it be in coverage, whether it be all the way 30 yards down the field as a receiver is trying to break free so he can make the play. Kamari Laster does that. And Kamari Laster for this team would make a lot of sense, not only in terms of depth, but you got to realize if you really wanted to play him inside, like let's just say. There's no conversation about the safety position. Let's just say going into next year, no, Jalen Peach is going to stay at strong safety and Jimmy Ward's going to play free safety, or they're going to be interchangeable safeties and we're not going to address the position. Well, you still need to worry about that nickel position and whether or not Akuda ends up getting that job, Henderson gets that job, or Laster wins it outright, you know that you are going to have a role for Laster on that football field in some way, shape, or form, whether it be in the nickel, whether it be on the outside. But this is a D'Amico Ryan's cornerback if I've ever seen one built in a lap. And, and honestly, he literally is a human ball of fire that is about ready to ignite your entire secondary. That was Cole Thompson. We're going to have more of him coming up on the other side to discuss the running back position. But I do want to let you guys know that this show was sponsored by Better Help. Uh, it can be easy to ignore our social battery and spread ourselves thin especially with social gatherings picking up uh, right now. Uh, it's pretty outside with the springtime. A lot of gatherings are picking up after the winter. Uh, what's the right amount of socializing for you and how do you recharge? Maybe you thrive around people or maybe you need some more alone time. Therapy can help you get that self-awareness you need to build a social life that doesn't drain your battery, which is something that we all need. If you're thinking about starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suitable to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist. And best part about it, you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Guys, go ahead and find your sweet spot 
in terms of a social spot, right? With BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash locked on today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H E L P slash locked on for 10% off your first month. Welcome back in, ladies and gentlemen, to this Tuesday installment of Locked On Texans. As, as you see, we still have our guy, my colleague over at Sports Illustrated, Cole The Thompson. champ is there. <laughs> yeah, and a so-called ch- – oh, my God, look at this, man. Did you see that, John? Did you see The champ again, is here. Do it again, Cole. Look at this, John. Don't miss it. Just, just... The champs. Oh, my goodness. Common just... man. Common man. What up? <laughs> But uh, why I can't come on all the time because I'm just gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna ruin your attention spam. That's it's terrible. <laughs> but I'm continuing here on Locked On Texans. Cole, uh, the one thing I love about having you on the show is that you can actually vouch for all of the things that I've been talking about on the show in terms of what we've been hearing from Coach D'Amico Rhines. Because just like myself, you have been sitting in every single press conference since the start of. I'm going to say OTAs last year. So I have not been to know. D'Amico Presser since he was hired. That's how long I've listened to everything that man has said in person. So I know what's going on. Or so, I know what's being said. I have no idea what's going on after that. None of us know what's going on. After that. <laughs> so with that being said, Cole, um, I do want to ask you this. When you go back and you take a look at and you recapture what Coach D'Amico Ryan said at his season Indians press conference right after they lost to the Baltimore Ravens. You know how bad it was for them running the football. Not only that, you have been sitting down with me every single press conference talking to Bobby Sloyd. We all know how important this team wants to run the football. Two-part question here. Um, One, where do you feel the priority list should be for the Houston Texans to address the offensive backfield in terms of when and where they should draft a running back? And is there a running back prospect out there entering the draft that you would like to see the Houston Texans take a chance on? So here's the thing, Cody. This is one of those few draft. Okay. I am very much team pay the running back. If the running back is the Mm -hmm. most important part of your offense, pay the man. Nobody in San Francisco is complaining about Christian McCaffrey's contract when he's doing what he's doing. Nobody is going to complain in Green Bay if you get the version of Josh Jacobs that made headlines in 2022 with the Las Vegas Raiders. Nobody is going to complain about Gibbs in Detroit when it's time. Nobody is going to complain about Jameer Gibbs. Nobody's going to complain about Joe Mixon if he lives up to the hype. Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to complain about those positions if they live up to the value. Mm -hmm. That being said, you always draft a running back. Every single year, take a running back as a flyer because they are a dime a dozen. And I don't mean that they are a dime a dozen player. I mean the position in general is viewed in that way, and it has to be. Because of how many times have we watched one running back have an incredible year, break out, and then immediately they fall right off the wagon. Hi, Damian Pierce. I don't mean to be rude in calling you out, but unfortunately you were the first person that comes to mind as of right now based off of last season. I mean, it literally was a major drop-off. He didn't even average three yards per play. But at the same time, it was a fourth-round running back, which means you don't have to invest as much time and effort into seeing what he can be. Now you're hoping that, He can continue to grow. He can continue to blossom. I believe that there still is a lot of intrigue and optimism for him going into year two, but it doesn't mean you have the promise of anything anymore, which is always a positive in my opinion. When it comes to the running back position this year, I don't like the class. I just don't. I don't Mm -hmm. like it at all. I don't think that there is a legit superstar tailback outside of maybe Jonathan Brooks from Texas. And Mm -hmm. even then, you are wondering what version of Brooks are you getting? Are you going to get the one that is going to, I see the horns being raised, John. I trust me. I knew it was coming. Mm -hmm. Are you going to get the version that was promise promising and showing all the upside of a dope Walker award finalist, be able to win inside of the red zone, fight for those hard yards, or are you going to get one that is a little injured prone coming off of the torn ACL? What version are you getting of him? But, When it comes to Trey Benson out of Florida State, I think he is a rotational back. I think the same thing about Bucky Irving coming out of Oregon. I think there's a lot of talent in terms of situational tailbacks, but if you're going into this year trying to bolster your running back room, I think the Texans were right to make the trade for for a guy like Joe Mixon. They had to go into the year knowing that they were going to be better off than what they were last season where they ranked 23rd against the run. I mean, 23rd in rushing offense, 
22nd in yards per attempt, and 28th in rushing touchdowns. They got to be better than that. And I think that Mixon does give that to them. The one player I would target, and I'm, I'm taking a flyer on this guy because of, I just I love the way he plays the game. I think he's a human pinball that literally bounces off, off defensive linemen and creates magic. Kamari Vidal out of Troy. This is a player that if you have not seen him, him, you have got to watch him. Last season, he finished second in rushing yards behind, you guessed it, Doak Walker Award winner Ollie Gordon, who had a pretty damn good showcase himself and probably would have been the only running back that we would have mentioned in the top 40 picks in this year's draft. That's how talented he was. He averaged over six yards per play last year. Uh, Vidal also, if I'm not mistaken, had 14 touchdowns, five foot eight, does a really nice job out of the backfield in terms of a receiving threat. If I'm not mistaken, he averaged 11.3 yards per se- uh, last season. I think he had 44 first down, uh, first down catches. So he's a guy that you can go ahead and just say, look, we're going to utilize him in a multitude of ways. And it's a player that you can probably say gets the exact same value in round six as probably a guy you're going to draft in round three. If you're Ooh. not sold on somebody like a Jonathan Brooks, if you're not sold on a Trey Benson, why over-exacerbate and overdraft somebody when you know that there is going to be talent that probably is at least upside and have a lot of promise and potential in rounds four, in round six, in round seven? That's where a guy like Vidal comes in line. I know Blake Horam is a name that a lot of people love. I know Blake Horam is a name that a lot of people are excited to see at the next level. I'm excited to see him hopefully get through a full 17-game season because if those knees are shot. They are so out of date. It is going to be like watching a old school, well, it's going to be like watching old brake pads try to stop a car going 90 miles an hour. Like that's how bad it can be. So I'm looking at guys that I know are going to have good seasons that didn't over exacerbate themselves in college and provide a little bit of intrigue and upside. I think a guy like Vidal does that. Round six, I would immediately target him. I'd have no qualms whatsoever bringing him in, letting him compete alongside Damian Pierce, letting him compete alongside Joe Mixon. And also, you can probably land somebody that's an undrafted free agent that's going to at least give yourself some bit of headlines during training camp because we see it every mm-hmm. year. We do. Mm-hmm. I like Cody Schrader a little bit too. Uh, I do like Cody Schrader. I do like Cody Schrader. Uh, pretty well. 1,600 yards last year, I believe. Uh, very good runner, low to the ground type of guy. So I, I do like him. And I, I kind of agree with you, man. If it's, if it's not Brooks early on in the draft, and when I say early, I don't mean first round, but just like an earlier running back, then I'll look at. But you got three seventh rounders. Gotta, yeah, gotta yeah. three, two, two, three, something like that. But you can take a flyer. Like, like Cody yeah. Schrader is going to be available in the seventh round. And people are like, well, how can you say he's going to be available? The, the guy went unnoticed throughout all of his high school career. He walked on to the University of Missouri after breaking every Division II rushing record possible. Yeah, he'll be there. Like, the <laughs> guy was so underappreciated at the D2 level. You think that all of a sudden now the NFL is going to wake up and go, Hmm, this guy, he, he he's beating the odds this many times. Let's see if uh, let, let's not have him beat it this time. No, they're gonna say no. You got to beat it again. You got to prove that you're worthy. Honestly, taking him in round seven might have more value than taking Trey Benson in round two. That's the way I view this running back. I'm line. not mad at that. Cole and- Thompson, everybody. Cole, oh, Cole, man. Listen, <laughs> once we have the draft, we'll have you back on uh, for a post draft show, so we can go through the prospects and we can talk about it. But I tell you what, one thing that Cody. Uh, Cody and I talk about all the time, Cole, you bring that energy. It's infectious. Mm. So hopefully it bleeds through the airways. It bleeds <laughs> through YouTube and our listeners uh, will feel that energy. But also let them know where our listeners and viewers can find you on social media and your work. So you can always follow me on social media at Mr. Cole Thompson. I post a lot of things over there. You can follow me on my own YouTube channel at Mr. Cole Thompson. Like when you hit subscribe to one hit subscribe to the other, like literally just do it at the same time. It works out a lot. Uh, and if you want to watch me continue to be the greatest thing alive because of I am a champion like John Hickman over here, we are the true <laughs> champions in this building. Uh, you can always go ahead and follow me on my own social media accounts at Mr. Cole Thompson and check out all my work at TexansDaily.com. And you guys can follow me on Twitter at Locked On Texans. I mean, we'll follow Locked On Texans. <laughs> but follow me on Twitter at John underscore Hickman 12. Um, I had a blast today, Cody. Mm -hmm. And as always, I'm your host, Cody M. Davis. Please remember to follow me on Twitter at Cody Davis underscore 24. Once again, it's Cody Seal, T-Y-D-A-V-I-S underscore 24. Until next time, ladies and gentlemen, peace.